Hello and welcome to Two Irish Guys Discussing Software. It's me, Tomás O'Leary, your host, along with Harry Candidai, our honorary Irishman. How are you, Harry? <laughs> I am doing great. Uh, great to be back, Tomás, with you. We didn't. Oh, we missed you last time, Brendan and S Steve O'Donnell and myself. So good to be back here with you and, uh, as usual, talk some gossip here. Never a dull moment yeah. in the tech industry, right? <laughs> I want to pick. I want to go. I've, 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 I've got a beef with you now here because you you went off and did an episode thirty nine with Brendan Walsh. This is episode forty with uh, Brendan. Came in. He comes back while I'm in Australia to do an episode, and I'm delighted to be in Australia, meeting our team out there. We're doing more business out there, but you could have at least dialed me in. You know, you're in India now. We were able to get you in, and we've got a we've a, we've a fab guest joining us, Andy uh, Andy Nagalowski, who's uh, director of supplier management at Sainsbury's. He's going to be joining us later. Tell a little bit about some of the story we've mentioned before with the award that we got last year from Sainsbury's, which we're really proud of. We'll talk to Andy about some of the things that Sainsbury's have been doing on their digital. Uh, initiatives and their their save to invest program that they kicked off, but I, I can't believe you got, you you did this without me. What what you know what what got into your head? You know you I know you own content, but uh, d d just mixing it up. We we let you drive business while Brendan and I we just you know talk shop here. But no, seriously, Steve O'Donnell. I mean, having a practitioner like him, having a practitioner like Andy today, just you know it just is so not that you and I don't have a good time, but it just brings a fresh, real customer perspective. So we couldn't have four Tomas, but next time I'll tell Brendan to move aside and you come back again if we do that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Listen, speaking of fresh and real, what's, be, what's going on in the world? We have a banking crisis again? That's absolutely crazy. Look at what's happened. Silicon Valley Bank, Credit Suisse, it's not over yet. And I was looking at actually your report. Speaking of, okay, there's two things I want to chat to you about. Banking crisis, that's a total chat about that. What's it mean for the tech industry? But also looking at all the job losses. I was reading about 155,000 jobs have been lost so far this year in the tech industry, which is basically the same number of jobs that were lost in the entire of 2022. Now we have a banking crisis. Now somebody's companies, they nearly lost all their cash. If SVB had gone down without the protection, crazy. Unbelievable. One thing after the other. I think the tech industry is getting hammered, but not only the tech industry. I live in Silicon Valley, as you know, Tomas, and, you know, there were some really scary uh, waves for a few days, a few weeks. And I had my buddies in, you know, different stages of software companies and CEOs. And one of them said, Harry, these were sleepless nights can you imagine the small companies putting all their savings or, or their your their operational money not knowing where they're going to make the next payroll that kind of thing hitting them again you know forget about the big guys i'm talking about the small medium sized businesses the startups the the exact thing that silicon valley is founded upon is at risk because of this unbelievable so here's the problem right the way i see it you know we don't need to go into the, there are many articles on why it happened and all that we don't need to yeah. rehash those you know poor management whatever it is but the small companies end up being the most impacted they are the the, the victims, right? And what's the impact of that? Think about that, Tomas. Think about the impact of a small company that's just trying to take off. And now suddenly they don't have the money to invest in efficiencies and cost optimization and some kind of putting money back into the product and transformation. The scary stuff. Uh, uh, yeah. But yeah, it doesn't bear thinking about it. But also you got the banks themselves, banks, insurance companies, financial services companies in general now. Where, what are they going to? They're they're not going to be able to do. They've they've less money to spend. They're they're worried themselves about have you know they can't allocate the same number of fun, funding to the sort of initiatives they've been planning to do. They're going to roll back. Oh, what are Credit Suisse going to do? You know now that they're owned by UBS. Oh, you know, there's going to be a whole change in strategy across the board. I mean that's just one example. You know it's crazy. Yeah, across all industries, and you hit it right. I mean. As it is, so leave company size aside, as you mentioned, right? The, the financial services, the banking, the insurance company, as it is, 
budgets are so stressed. I mean, IT, you know, heading into this year, it was already so stressed, you know, inflation and all the headwinds. And now you add this thing on top. It's just, I. well, what's the silver lining here, right? I mean, what does it force companies to do? I think it forces IT executives and procurement leaders to be just ruthless prioritizing what's most important for their companies or else it's going to be, you know, it would be a, a very dire situation if they don't do that. So let's see. I think I think yeah. the way I see it is it puts the discipline back. It wakes us all up. But this thing still happening after a decade, just unreal, puts the burden back on the companies to be most smart about their spending, yeah. you know? Yeah. Go well, where are they going to spend the money? Actually, one of the areas they will definitely spend the money on is AI. Because you know, even in, it, it's been nuts even since we last spoke, Harry. The whole thing has gone yeah. crazy. Chat GPT. I had heard of this, this, you know, this time last year. Suddenly now everybody's heard about it. In fact, I, I probably haven't heard about it six months ago. You know, and then you have like count, the counter kind of conversation going on. Did you hear Elon Musk now, one of the one of the kind of founders of OpenAI, stepped away from it a couple of years ago. He's now involved in a organization called the Future of Life Institute. He's completely walking back from it. You look at Microsoft. I don't know if you saw this one. They have uh, laid off their ethics and society team attached to the AI program after spending, is it ten billion on the on on uh, on the initiative, as well as laying off ten thousand people last year. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? It's there's there's a there's a lot of scary that, stuff that going on I there. Get... Well, great opportunity, but lots of scary things happen. That that. Microsoft laying off their AI ethics team. I just can't get my head around that. You know, here we are talking about investing in chat GPT and, you know, billions of dollars and you lay off what, 30, 40 people, AI ethics. I mean, that's the, it's so ironic that, you know, you, you have to have some kind of compliance and some kind of oversight. I have no idea on the rationale. I don't think, you, you know, really, are you spending money? Are you saving money just taking out that one small team? When on the other hand, you want to say that we're moving so furious and furiously fast on AI. That one <laughs> boggles my mind. I have no idea why that happened. But generally speaking, it is so hot. Coming back to Silicon Valley, I just have, uh, you know, just just my conversations with, with some of the investment my friends in the com uh, in the community, every anything AI hot getting funded, so there is money, right? They're they're pouring money into this, and everybody is jumping on the bandwagon. But here's the thing: how do you separate the shiny new from the real technology that's going to help the business? AI is fantastic in terms of the future and moving in that direction. I personally believe, I mean, you look at Microsoft integrating, um, you know, chat GPT into you know, the office suite, you know, what do they call it? Yeah. Copilot or so for Word and all that. So that's great. Chat GPT by itself, it is still ways away before it becomes truly contextual from a B2B marketing perspective or other. Con so we got to figure out, I think com the companies, in my opinion, Tomas, that's going to um, really stand out in the space who who would just not go after the, the glitter, right? What is the value that I'm giving back to the company? How do I take this process? What's the context? How can I put, first get the context down, get the speed, get speed is always good and scale. You crack that code and give value back to the customer. That's the holy grail of AI. But oh, this is this thing is going well, to go well, on for so, a long time. <laughs> so we're recording this on Teams. Do we think uh, that in, in a few months' time we won't even have to be involved in this? It could actually do this podcast for us. I mean, wait, where's Great. this going? To? Yeah, okay. I'm going to sit back now and let's see how GBT gets on with this podcast. I probably probably do a better job. Let's be honest. Like, who knows? I was just no, I tell you one thing. You asked me a question. I would have said, you know. This one, I don't get my head around. It's ironic. Microsoft doesn't, uh, has decided to lay off its uh, AI ethics team. And I stop and let Chad GPT talk about the rest, right? Yes, no, that's no, true. No. Why are they doing no, 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 that? But here's, <laughs> but here's what I want to say to you. Here's what I want to say to you, right? So what I won't say, it won't give, it won't give, neg it won't give negative stories about Microsoft. That's the problem. And we have been doing this show, 40 episodes. We've struggled to find stories about Microsoft that are bad. They've done mostly good stuff. Now we got a couple of stories. We also, I see in Germany, 
there be there's a, a, the German government that taking a uh, they open an investigation into Microsoft to, because of their size, their impact in the marketplace. That's that's brand new. If that happens in Germany, it's a good chance it's going to happen all over all over Europe and, and other countries. One point on that German story, Tomas, that really caught my attention is the equivalent of what they call the federal cartel office. That word, I mean, you know, federal cartel office, they are looking for companies, as they say, of paramount significance. It's not, they're not alleging anything wrong. They're just saying, you know, these guys are so big now and so dominant that, you know, they are, are they going to prohibit other businesses from any specific transactions or are they going to dominate the market? Uh, like, you know, they pointed at Google and Meta, what, what about a year, year and a half ago. But anyway, I just was, uh, whoa, federal cartel office. <laughs> I had no yeah. idea that there was a term like that. Yeah, referring yeah, to no, the no, big no. guys. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, there's two stories about Microsoft. And I see also Bill, Bill Gates is at, back is dating the ex, the, the recently deceased widow of the ex recently deceased Mark Hurd, ex CEO of, of Oracle. He's been off spotted. Well, I was in Australia. He was also down there knocking around. I wasn't with him, by the way. So, yeah. So we got a, we got a, we got a couple of stories of Microsoft. I want to bring it on. There's a couple of more. Speaking, speaking of Germany, there's a few more, some news items you want to touch on. I saw, speaking of Germany, the SAP, they sold, they've they dropped their stake in Qualtrics. Do you see that? Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. What, $12.5 billion? S silver, silver Lake. Decent. Yep. Silver Lake picked it up. Um, not surprising. I mean, I, I don't know how well they were doing that. I haven't kept up with those individual products of SAP, like Qualtrics, for example. I know that they probably made some decent return, what, 8%, 10%, something like that. But I think overall, uh, they got hammered, right? I think um, the Qualtrics beginning, what, how much did they lose from $24 billion to $5 billion? I mean, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's the kind of drop in revenue from 21 to 22 yeah, I mean, you know, I, if I was in their shoes looking at, you know, hey, let's get this thing out. Who knows? I don't know their pro how are they going to fill that gap at that product suite, but clearly it wasn't performing. So now Silver Lake's got it for 12.5 and they'll probably figure it out. Yeah, and as I see the SAP users are being out there. User group here in Europe have been asking for the same features in the on-premise software as the cloud. So they're pushing back on the move. They're saying they're happy with the investors. Yeah. Uh, so I, th I think a lot of this trend will happen, in my opinion, Tomas, is any of these acquisitions that an Oracle or SAP or Microsoft have acquired over time, I think continuous rationalization of their portfolio, will it cannibalize their cloud revenue? Are they going, is it, it's going to make sense? Because at the end of the day, what's their game plan? They want you all in the cloud, in their infrastructure, in their platform. So you're all nicely, tightly locked in for a many years. And if uh, there's a one-off situation like, or a one-off product like Qualtrics that came along for a ride or any others, yeah, they'll probably start divesting that and consolidating, you know, from a platform, you know, it, it's, it all goes back to, uh, let me give you a sweet mindset, right? Uh, rather than Ariba and Concur and Qualtrics, they're all locking you into the SAP cloud platform. I yeah, we're seeing push. We're seeing pushback. We're seeing pushback, and I also see Oracle. Speaking of big, big players, Oracle, Big Red are are they starting to let job people go from Cerner? Did you see that? They spent twenty eight billion back in June, and now they're starting to let the staff go. Bloomberg had a report out there recently. They'd begun layoffs. They were only told actually was it last week? I think they were only told started to tell staff about it across the board, across the whole board. Typical stuff that they do, you know. So they they, they don't hang around, do they? Same point I made just in the previous one with the call trick. I think certain are in the same boat. If I, you know, if you're in Larry Ellison's position, he's looking at, you know, is this coming in the way of my Oracle cloud infrastructure is, you know, eat into my cloud revenue. And the statement, if I recall on that article was, hey, OCI, uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, OCI is far more, is just more efficient than certain data centers that they acquired. But they have to create a story around it and now say it's not relevant anymore and we are downsizing. And one fine day, I think they'll just cut it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we do have to talk about our old friends, IBM. We can't, we can't not talk about them. We've got some news on them. <laughs> I did see, I saw a couple of things on them. First thing I saw, actually, I don't know whether you saw this one, 
the Schwab US Dividend Equity EFT, which are these um, exchange trade funds that you can that you could buy, which is one of the gilt edge ones, has had IBM in its top ten stocks that you could buy. So about a hundred stocks in it. It's for the first time kicked it out. Doesn't even, it's not even in there at all. Usually it was about four, over four percent of the total pool was IBM stock. They've just refreshed it. Not even in it at all. Doesn't even drop to one percent or half a percent. To be fair, IBM stock's not doing too bad at the moment, but obviously maybe they know something that we don't know, or maybe they know something we do know. <laughs> stocks <laughs> under pressure, and and they're starting now as a result of probably all of these things we talked about before. We've been telling a lot of stories to pay their staff and the particularly their board, their executives, less money. Now it's still a lot of money, to be honest with you. We got our, our Arvind Krishna, he was a port, port of 16 and a half million in 2022. Uh, but in 21, he got 17 and a half million. So that's that's tough. But but hey, trending in the right direction. How about that? Right. They are, yeah, yeah. They are cost cutting in multiple ways, but they need to be more ruthless. Yeah, well, they're tw- they got they got maybe this year with the twenty eight percent increase in soft remains that they threw into some of the some of the markets. You know, the six seven percent reduction there. If that keeps going, you know, maybe maybe there'll be a little bit less on the uh, across the board. Uh, the CFO, by the way, was the only guy who got actually got a salary boost. Yeah, though they didn't do very well. Uh, some of the execs. So I mean, I wonder what that will mean long term. Will they? Will, are they for the high road? What do you think? What's your prediction, Harry? I, I just can't even fathom. I can't imagine that in a in a situation like this, executives getting pay, rise, pay raises like that just boggles my mind. You know, but you talk about uh, job losses at the beginning of the whole beginning of the program here. How do you justify that? So I don't know. I think it's you know, it just doesn't feel right that not nothing wrong with making a lot of money. Trust me, I love money, but not at the expense of reducing reduction of force or for any of that. But I think all this will all this will step next. Brilliant, brilliant. But I want to make a point because I'm going to bring Andy Nagalewski on this one now. That's IBM trying to save money. I'm not sure how much they're really going to save. But if anyone knows how to save money, Andy Nagalewski Director of Supplier Management at Sainsbury's, they have run some a very unique supplier program for the last number of years, all through COVID and before and since. We are very proud to be part of it. Andy, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Yeah, good afternoon, guys. You keeping well? Keeping think, very well. Many of us would accept a sixteen and a half million pound a year salary, right? Yeah, I'd go for bad. seventeen. It's not bad if you can well. get it. <laughs> yeah. Is that is that where you start in, in Sainsbury's? To, to, you, is that where you go first? Go to the top guy and say, okay, we want to get six, seven percent off everybody at the top and see where, where, yeah, where it gets I mean, us. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, just some of the stories you just talked through, what's going on in the industry at the minute, it, it's a real whirlwind, isn't it? Yeah, no, you you wouldn't want to be. It's not for the faint-hearted business and our, our industry or any industry at the moment. It's it's, uh, no, no, it's a it, tough place it's to be. Been like that. Yeah, last three or four years, it's just one thing after another, isn't it? Yeah, you don't. You I mean you think about, you know, wh- wh- is there any such thing as an easy life anymore? Are we? Are we all? Is, is this? Is this it forever? What, one day, one day, <laughs> in the in the far distance, there will be one. <laughs> Listen, Andy, it's great to have you here. You in Sainsbury's have a fantastic supplier program and it really is and i've said this to you face to face on on a pri- pri- privately I, I we're delighted that you've joined us on the podcast hopefully you'll, you'll be able to tell us a little bit about it what, what made you want to do it uh ultimately and how how successful has it has it been because we've seen from as a supplier to to sales we've seen it as a great success and and it's not something we've seen very often in in any other companies and we've got over 150 customers worldwide uh all enormous organizations but we've r- rarely seen something like you what you have in, in in sainsbury's could you tell us a little bit about it and maybe tell us a little bit about you as well so that so that the, so the audience can know yeah, a no, more absolutely. about you so i've been in i've been in retail for over 20 years running Varying a mixture of sort of buying commercial supply management teams across businesses like Sainsbury's, Dixon's Carphone, and Walgreens prior to that. Part, supplier partnership is fundamental, particularly when you go into the challenging times we're facing. And I've seen over the years and learned through good and bad experience how you can get that model right to really power your business. 
And I think particularly at Sainsbury's, we, we talk a lot about our Save to Invest program, and that's really driven around sort of simplification of our business. And that's through, for me, around our supplier management strategy, it's around having bigger and fewer partnerships and really underpinning that by having a really world-class supply relationship management center of excellence that underpins it. And I guess there are kind of three core focuses that we're trying to drive. The first is around protect. So as we go into whether it's the pandemic, Brexit, you know, we talked about the Silicon Valley situation, making sure that our business and our partnerships are working with them to get the best possible value from those contracts that we have. And then from a control perspective, having that single source of truth with our partners so we understand you, we understand how your business works, we can work mutually to get the most out of the partnership, and then it then moves into the unlock. And I think if you could get those first two things right, you really start to have the right conversations between our company and our strategy and what you're trying to drive to get that win-win mentality. And the win-win mm. mentality in a lot of companies is lost. You know, it's it's all about let's get the cheapest price. And don't get me wrong, we want the most value, but there are many ways you could unlock that value. And I think the program we built, particularly in Sainsbury's over the last three years, is really transformed our business. And if I just put a lens just on our technology function, you know, three years yeah. ago we had 400 suppliers and now we're down to 140. And we think we could probably take it to 100 but the different conversations we're having with those 140, it, it's completely chalk and cheese. And I think partners really, you know, obviously you've been part of that journey, partners really appreciate a different way of engagement because it drives mutual value. And if you can get the mutual value right, when you have the tough times like we are today, mm. you tend to be on the right side of the coin, right? When, you're, when your partners are squeezing you, you typically get squeezed a little less. And it's not something that I would have thought would be driven from a as you know retailers have a have a reputation for being hard negotiators. Um, I mean you when we because we deal with all industries and you know we and we deal with a non-retailing organization and they hear oh you deal with large retailers you must be you must be well able to handle the robustness of the negotiations. Yeah that, but actually I don't, you, I don't you, think you lose that though right yeah yeah, I, yeah you haven't lost that at all but okay. it's a, it's fascinating to see the ability to do that. It's almost like uh, it, it's it's you're 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 being hard but fair. Yeah. And you're in get yeah, you're you're inclusive. You're, yeah, you're bringing people on the journey with you. So it's easier for everybody to understand what 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 quite you can get out of it. It's fantastic, I think, you know. Um I think it's the transparency. And I think that's where a lot of companies hold back this almost fear of sharing what you're doing and what your strategy is with your partners. And I think if you could build the transparency and trust between you, you know you're gonna have a difficult conversation when it comes to renewal or a new purchase or an RFP or an RFI. But you can have a really collaborative conversation. Yes, that part's going to be difficult, but you know when you get it live, you're going to work mm. together to drive the most value for both of us out of that product or solution. And then going forward, mm. you know you're going to have the opportunity to grow to grow the cake ultimately over time. And as I say, it, it's yeah. a fine balance because you know our CEO firmly believes in this principle of driving really strong strategic partnerships, and it's something that served Sainsbury's really well over the years. And our approach is probably slightly different to other businesses out there, but I think that slightly different approach pays dividends. It really does. And when you look at that, say four hundred to one hundred and forty suppliers today, oh, that's that, that's that's in the last three four years, isn't it? You're talking yeah, about the last that's three years. Last time. three yeah. years. Yeah. So, and it may well go to one hundred. That journey, the the you still you still transformed your so that's the supplier transformation, but you've still transformed your te your technology stack. You've still Completely. you've still moved forward with with new deployments and new changes, haven't you? Yeah, innovation. You know, the old saying, you know, innovate or die, is is very yeah. true in retail, right? You you've really got to make sure. And you talked a lot earlier about prioritization. Prioritization is fundamental in retail now. You've got to get the right proposition. Fundamentally, our strategy is around giving our customers the best possible experience in our store. And you can only do that by innovating. And I think for us, that save to invest journey of really driving our costs and having the right conversations, looking at continuous improvement, pulling away from products that aren't delivering value for the business to allow us to invest heavily in future technologies is fundamental. And I think we've got the right balance. Don't get me wrong, it is incredibly difficult but if you invest the right time there, it can make a huge difference. It really can. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious to know, because I know our listeners, and Harry will step in in a minute, but, but my question to you is for our listeners about, we got a whole broad range of them, but they'd be curious, so how, do we, how would they do something similar? So where do you, where would you start? Where do you start that journey from a 400 to one to 140? Where, where, where does the beginning there? Yeah, so I guess the journey for me was, obviously I was brought into the business, you know, to do what I'm doing today, but it starts with exec buy-in. The exec in your business really need to be bought into the vision of driving a strategic partnership management strategy because it is fundamentally different way of working that a lot of business operate in. You then need to go through a fairly extensive segmentation of supply so you really understand, you know, what all of those 400 partners do, where are they adding value, you know, where you should invest and where you should divest. And then you then can start to build a strategy that starts to unpick that. So, you know, we have a, a fairly simple strategy in terms of how we invest our resources behind our key partners. We have platinum, gold, silver and bronze partners. And obviously our biggest partners, we put the most resource behind. And then for our smaller bronze partners, we create that center of excellence to help our colleagues have the right conversations with our partners. But it's all about the beginnings. So it's about getting those foundations, being really clear of what the roadmap is and then how are you going to execute that change? Because you know, as you touched on, 400 partners to 140, amongst all of the other transformation we're doing within the business is huge. So you've got to make sure that that execution is one done at pace because you need to move quickly, particularly in the current world we live in, but also you need to make sure that the execution is smooth. So we have teams looking after our suppliers day to day, but I also have a, a supplier strategy and transformation team, and their sole role is to make sure the execution of that change is as seamless as it possibly can be. And thankfully, we've had the odd bump in the road over the last couple of years. We've actually had a fairly seamless transition out of that partner network. And I think if you can get, you know, get the buy-in at the beginning in the business to put the investment behind a program like this, you can see huge dividends and obviously the simplification side, but ultimately from a cost out model, it makes a massive difference to your business. It really does. Wow. Harry, you wanted to ask a question there, did you? Andy, partially, you answered my question partially, but it's so refreshing and it's it's fascinating to hear. We're all getting so tired of, the lo- you know, the first place everybody goes to is let's cut our people. You know, if I want money to, I go, you know, all these layoffs and this and that. It's just refreshing to hear how Sainsbury is approaching it. Wait, there's another way to do this. Let's consolidate partners and all that. My question was more uh, going to be around, which you partially answered is, how did you bring the key stakeholders in this journey with you, who are they? I think the executive team, if there's the thinking that it's innovate or die, guys, we need to innovate and find, but let's better find ways to innovate. Um, did you have to, let's just say your IT partners, did you have to show them, uh, it doesn't have, nothing happens overnight, right? Did you have to show some quick wins under your belt and build on the momentum and show them, yeah, well, let's cut here, but this will get you this project. How did that work, Andy? It will be great to see who your partners were to get such a successful program in place. Yeah, I mean, the first question you had was, you know, around, I think, I think as a company, we've got the balance right between our colleagues, our customers, and our shareholders. And you need to find the balance, right? So I think we've got that right. And if you see a lot of the news stories today around us investing heavily in colleague pay, so as we're saving money from the business, we're also benefiting our shareholders. We're giving our customers the best possible pricing in the market. We're also rewarding our colleagues for that simplification. You know, the sort of journey starts with understanding who are the who are the colleagues within the business at an exec level that really need to buy into this program. And when I joined the organization, I was brought in by our CIO at the time, Phil Jordan, and he was bought into it. But, you know, I had to take his broader direct reports on a journey for them to firstly buy into how we could make a real impact in their area. And then across our sort of top 10, top 15 partners, just having the initial conversations, firstly, to understand what's working, what's not, what can we do differently, what we're looking to do, A, does this solve the problem? what else are we missing and as we've as we've worked our way through the sort of last two or three years we've continued to innovate our proposition so more recently we launched an innovation hub and one of the biggest challenges we've had is 
we've probably got 90 percent of it right over the last sort of couple of years but innovation getting getting the forum to bring our technologists and our product teams together to have the right conversations is probably the hardest thing in vendor management to do and the innovation hub that we've now got is really starting to almost be the glue for making that happen for allowing those conversations to take part so that you know when a member of our product team has a problem they need to solve they've got a really good community to go out to so i think first it's around listening and you know that's not something that a lot of companies do listen to your partners understand what's working think about how you need to provide training and resources to your colleagues because in a lot of businesses you make this assumption that all of your colleagues know how to engage with partners, know how to manage contracts, know how to manage to get the best value. And the reality is that's just not true. So things like we've launched the learning directory, which really supports colleagues, you know, train and understand how they get the most out of the partners, been really strong on communication and events to bring our partners and our colleagues together. And and through a number of those tools, it's really allowed us to, to take those partners on a journey in the infancy, to your point, start to get a bit of buy-in and showing that, the, the concept is turned into reality and then it's just been a learning journey the whole way through and as i say we're constantly innovating because what we have today you know will be won't be quite right in 12 months time we need to keep reinventing ourselves to make sure that as the technology moves and you know currently as you sort of talked about there's a lot of change at the minute there's a lot of big technology companies losing a lot of people you know how are we going to be affected by that how do we work with the partner to make sure that from a service perspective, we're not one of those retailers that are impacted by some of the changes and uncertainty happening in the industry. So I think it's it's all about that collaboration. And I think, you know, you can always do that more. And I think for us, it's just finding the balance. How do you get that right between you and the partner? The multiplier effect that I'm seeing is, you know, you, you, you're cutting in one area, but you're also partnering with the business units to invest in something that's going to add more value, right? And it goes back to that, the key stakeholder value but anyway i think you know thank you for uh, sharing and, and that to your, Go to ahead. your point there you know the the supply relationship management team that i have they are business partners they're working with the ctos the directors of engineering the directors of product and their teams they are there as part of their team part of their community to help them navigate all of the challenges that they face into and then similarly for the partner you've got that single person you can go to you know, in a company like Sainsbury's, which is, let's be honest, it's a huge company, having one person you can go to to kind of have a little bit of therapy with, let's say, you know, is, is really important, right? And, and partners really value having that single person they can go to to help them navigate the organisation. So, yeah, as I say, we would always want to do bigger and better, but I think we found the balance. And now one of my roles within the business is to take what we're doing today and I'm rolling out across the whole of the organisation. and. You know, it's exactly the same framework, exactly the same principles, and it works whether it's in technology, supply chain, you know, shared service center, professional services. But the stakeholders still need to be taken on that journey. They need to buy into it. They need to see that the value that we're talking about can be realized. And then similar for the partner, they're not going to invest more and more time and resource unless in the nicest possible way, there's also something in it for them. And if you're an account director and you've got two, three objectives, and we can help you bring that to life in our business and vice versa. There are four or five things we want from you as a partner. If you can bring that together and, and have that mutually beneficial conversation, as I say, you game change the relationship and you work in a very, very different way than many companies work today. It sounds like you've got a tremendous opportunity, though. I mean, you're, if, you, if you're taking the success in IT and you're bringing it out across the organization, that's a that's a fantastic testament to the to the work you've been able to do, clearly. And it's a great vote of confidence. It is, it is. But, you know, on the flip to that, we're still having very difficult conversations with the many partners, right? You know, all of those partners and, you know, you're one of our partners. A lot of our partners under and are under a lot of duress. You know, they've gone through the pandemic, they've scaled up, and now all of a sudden it's not quite, things aren't quite as rosy, and they're under pressure. They're under pressure to drive their costs up. They're facing into the inflationary challenges we are. And I think it's finding that balance, right, because we're, we're both feeling the pinch. How do you find the middle ground where, in reality, in some cases, neither of us are winning? Mm. That's the reality. We're all, we're all facing yeah. into employee costs going up, 
you know, some of the cost of the products and services that we buy going up. So it's, it's a very fine balance. But I think if you could do it in the best possible spirit and have the right kind of conversations, you could find a way to navigate through through the challenging waters that we're facing in. Yeah. And when you were rolling out your, your programme, you had a number of key initiatives. One of them was obviously your, your Save to Invest one. Can you talk about those key initiatives and how you, how you identified those, and how you agreed them, and then how they applied to your suppliers and partners that, that, that ultimately culminated in the awards that you gave out last year? Yeah, so so in technology, we literally, we've just obviously changed um, leaders. So obviously, Phil, our CEO, has moved on to Pastures New, retired. And we have a new CTO and Chief Product and Analytics Officer um, who were previously part of the leadership team. So we've kind of reset what our sort of key priorities are. And the first is around sort of customer and capability driven. The second is around delivering valuable products that customers love. The third is around simplifying and modernizing our technology, delivering early and often. And then the fourth is around cash effectiveness, efficiency and impact. And then there are some sort of internal ones around sort of inclusivity, so an inclusive place where everybody loves to work. So there are kind of five key missions that we have within technology. And we work with our partners around strategic account plans and we'll bring those five key missions to life. So in May, we're doing a, a big partner event where we're kind of relaunching what the next sort of three years of um, Sainsbury's Tech's all about. We want to work with our partners to bring those five things and then become part of what our partners are, are sort of working with us on. And then similarly, we want to understand with our partners, you know, what are the key priorities for them? Because just like we have four or five key initiatives so do our partners. So we need to just use those account plans to kind of bring that together with something that ultimately mutually works for both of us. So, you know, it's worked really well. It's that collaboration. It's that transparency. It's the right conversation. It's the right engagement from all the way at the top of the organization, CEO, all the way down. Um, and, I, and I think that's allowing us to really hone in on the things that matter for our business. And particularly as we go into, you know, what our unbelievably challenging waters in the minute around all of the sort of inflationary costs we're seeing in the market, we really do need to double down on those things to make a difference. So, you know, it's even more important than ever before that bringing those sort of partner conversations and us together to power our future are done really, really well. Yeah. Uh, I love this. I love those five initiatives actually. And, and, and they're great. You brought it on from what you had last year particularly the simplification of technology right up our streets and cash effectiveness, trying to manage your money. You know, we'd love to help you out with all of that stuff. So delighted that we're we're part of the journey with you. Uh, I think they're they're great initiatives. I think they're really important ones as we as we work through the choppy waters. Yeah. So just touching on go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean j- j- just the other piece. So obviously we did a supplier awards um our first in-person awards after three years since I joined the company, first opportunity. And, you know, we invited our sort of top sort of 40, 50 partners, three, 300 strong to our auditorium, opportunity for our, t- our partners to meet our CEO, um, our digital director, and a lot of our operating board. But we also did a supplier awards and obviously Origina were a, a key winner, uh, which is fantastic, particularly in the save to invest category. So congratulations. Um, Thank you. You know, I think you guys have played a pivotal role, right? You know, We're having to make really tough decisions with our partners, right, around how do we find a way of unlocking value, saving money in a way that's going to ultimately benefit our business. And, you know, originally have been brilliant. Yeah. You know, some of the projects we've done over the last couple of years, it's taken out millions of pounds of costs in our business. You know, in that, those millions of pounds of cost allow us to reinvest back into the organization, whether that's from a colleague perspective, whether that's from a customer or to our shareholders. And I think you know, some of the work we've done with you will continue to do with you will hopefully continue to transform our business for the better as well. So, you know, thank you for the work you and the team have done. It's appreciated. It's absolutely our pleasure, Andy. And thank you for your very kind words. Thank you for the award and long may it last. Uh, Thanks for joining us. No pressure for this year's award as well, right? (laughs) Well, I like it too. I've already identified two that we could go for. So I'll be in touch with the team after this after this podcast. Brilliant. Listen, Andy, it's great to have you as a guest. We've had a great conversation. You've shared with us some great insights there. Uh, Any final thoughts out of you, Harry, before we we wrap up? No, fascinating story, Andy, very inspiring. And yes, as Tomas said, we appreciate uh, the recognition and the opportunity to participate in this journey with you, right? I mean, you know, that's what we want to do is... uh, value on both sides so 
thank you again for all that and for sharing such level of detail. And hopefully the uh, the listeners will benefit from your program and learn from you. And say more about the guys. More than welcome. Brilliant. Brilliant. Listen, I can't believe that's it. Harry, we're done. Another podcast finished. We'll be back next time. But as always, we love to hear from our listeners. So please, if you have any questions, anything you heard on this podcast, you'd like to reach out to us, like to talk to us, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So info at original.com is the email address. And until we speak again, two Irish guys discussing software. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Andy. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Cheers, guys.